Welcome to this episode of The Sinful Show. We've got a very awesome interview for this episode. We talked to John Woodruff, director and producer of the upcoming horror movie, Animal Among Us. Oh, yes. This was a very fun interview. Switching some things up on you guys. Stay tuned. All right, everyone. I am here with John Woodruff. How you doing, John? Hey, Ray. I'm great. Long time, man. Yeah, very long time. Yeah. Um, for everyone that doesn't know, I've known John for a very long time. Yeah, very... we don't. We probably don't even need to say how long. Actually, <laughs> we don't want people to know how old we are, right? <laughs> uh, age is just a number, man. I, I I'm feeling pretty good. So. Yeah, I'm not. I'm hanging in there myself. It seems like there's a few of us, you know, that still. Still got some fight left. To, like yeah. you said, it, it's been a long time, man. Way back, <laughs> way back to high school, at least. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, but yeah, everyone, this is this is awesome to have him here on on this episode. John, he is in the field of movie making. Uh, allegedly, yes, I, I am. Uh, just completed just completed production on my first feature film, Animal Among Us. Um, so you know, a full ninety minutes. And this was the first feature film that I'd worked on where I was kind of a lead, where I was the director and the producer. Um, worked on other films in various capacities, but usually under other people. So this was the first one where where I was uh, allegedly the guy you know, in charge. So it was an interesting experience. <laughs> so, so you're the head motherfucker in charge on this one, huh? I mean, pretty damn close. I've got a partner that would be of equal status. His name is Jonathan Murphy. Um, he's based out of Texas. He's originally from Texas, but he's, he's actually based out of LA and we met in LA and uh, he wrote the script and then he was a producer on it. So he was the writer producer. I was the director producer. So for all intents and purposes, it ended up being a pretty good 50 50 split on a lot of the decision making and a lot of the strategy behind the film, which it's such a huge undertaking that it was actually great to have him as a partner because um, it's just it's almost too much for one person. Right, right. So he he was the he was the actual per person that wrote the script for it. Yeah. So a while back out in Los Angeles, I was doing some screenwriting consultation, and so you know if somebody had written a script and they wanted to get some feedback on it, they would send it over to me, and I would uh, give them some notes for a small fee. And I had a, a friend who had met Jonathan Murphy and. Um, had read a script and she really liked it. She wanted to get some additional feedback and thoughts on it. So she passed it over to me and I gave her some feedback and we started going back and forth. And apparently he really liked my input on the script. So he asked if he could meet me. So the three of us got together and started talking and decided that this looks like something we wanted to try to partner up on and make. And that's basically kind of how it all went down. You know, I, I tried to talk him out of it. I was like, we're going to get in so much trouble with this. This is a huge undertaking. He's like, oh, no, man, let's go for it. Let's do it. And here we are, you know, at the other other side of the uh, of the endeavor. And all in all, I think everything went all right. So so you said some, some you guys were going to get in some kind of trouble. I mean, what do you mean by that? Oh, just like it's such a huge process, man. It's like. The development process, pre-production, production, post-production, post trying to navigate them, uh, sales and distribution, and then even just like all of the legalities with filmmaking. So uh, when I was saying trouble, I just kind of was like referring to like a huge undertaking. And obviously, like whenever you're working with a tremendous number of people, there can always be like obstacles, um, conflict, but <laughs> I'll say obstacles. 
as to where, you know, people are pulling in different directions because they want different things. They have different motivations. Um, there's just different things kind of like driving their interest in the project. So it's a lot to manage and there's a lot of kind of minutia that can really sink a project very quickly. So it's like, if your legalities aren't like fully in order, um, it can really come back to bite you at the end of the project where you can get hung up in sales and distribution because you don't have like a clear chain of title. Um, so it's like, even from like the moment that we started, you know, it's like he had written the script We were going to produce it together. We formed an LLC to produce the film under. Um, But then, you know, it's like the LLC has to acquire the script, even if it's only for a dollar. Like you have to be able to prove that like that transaction occurred. Otherwise, like when you get to sales and distribution, they want to show that you have ownership to the intellectual property and rights to the material. And they want to trace it clear back to the person with which it originated. So even though we were both like managing members of the LLC, we were partners in this, we were both producers on this, you still have to make sure that you hit like every single one of those little points. Um, Because if you don't, it's like when you get to the end of the road and you don't have one of those things in order, it can be kind of tricky to like navigate around it. You know what I'm saying? So basically, I mean, couldn't you guys have like an attorney help you with something like that? Or are you guys just trying to avoid that and just kind of like, Hey, I'm, we're doing this on our own. And, you know, I mean, obviously like in a perfect world, you're going to have an attorney that um, can help you through the entire process. And entertainment law is like a very specific field of law. So generally you ideally have an entertainment attorney because the rules are so different than what you find in, other companies and organizations and areas of law in this situation i had a tremendous amount of experience as i said earlier in producing so i basically knew like the steps and the procedures i had stuff from previous projects that i was able to pull on in kind of like putting together a lot of documentation and again stepping us through the process and then fortunately my little sister who i'm sure you remember from high school laura she grew up and became an attorney. So, oh wow, <laughs> yeah. So she had a huge focus on contract law, um, and was really able to help us kind of then like navigate a lot of the legal intricacies and help us, you know, understand like what we could do and what we couldn't do, um, and where we might need to get additional legal counsel and where we were kind of in the clear. So that way, you know, it's like if we did need the expertise of a lawyer in the entertainment industry we could seek him out but for a very specific task and in a very abbreviated period of time just to keep our costs a little bit lower so that's kind of how we that's kind of how we navigated it on this one yeah that's crazy it's like uh uh i don't don't even realize uh with uh, movie production there was so much uh moving parts behind the scenes to where you have to think of legalities or stuff like that. Um, yeah. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, it's like, we, we all sit there and it's like, we consume media like nonstop. I mean, as far as even like listening to this podcast or turning on the TV or driving down the street, listening to the radio or whatever media you're playing through your radio. And so it's very, it's very easy to just kind of like take it at face value. You know, it's like, this is the film I'm watching. This is a TV show I'm watching. And you really, kind of like forget how much goes on behind it to make all of that possible and that's something too where when people ask with smaller films you know like oh why does it take so long if you're trying to go through all of these steps by yourself without like a major production company behind you or a studio where it's like a machine that just kind of like can churn through the process it can be a very long arduous process uh i mean like our placement offering memorandum which is what we use to raise money with It has to be in line with the Securities Exchange Commission's rules and regulations, which change from time to time. So, of course, it has to be updated every time you're doing a new raise to make sure you're not uh, inadvertently breaking any laws in the financing of your film. And, dude, that document is like 600 pages and like 10 point font. It's ridiculous. And that's just so you can start to, like, raise the money and not be a violation of, like, the SEC. So, and, and this is still like on a small film. I mean, I, I personally haven't gotten to work on like a studio project yet, but I'm completely fascinated with it just because of like 
I, I can't imagine just the the process, like how large the process is, how many people like play into it and how many different factors there are in the equation that can kind of like affect the process. And to me, it's really interesting because people are, are, can be very critical of films and of music and it's fine because they're consumers and they're looking at it for entertainment value. And so they should be critical of it to a point, but it's interesting because when you get into the process, you're like, man, it's like, all of the money in the world on some of these big projects doesn't necessarily mean that you can do anything in the world. It doesn't actually make the process easier. In a lot of ways, I think it complicates it because then all of a sudden it's like, you just have more cooks in the kitchen and you have to appease more people and you have more people <laughs> pulling you in different directions. So that's kind of a really fascinating thing to me is, is that stuff behind the scenes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it's funny because you said you said uh, people being critical and stuff like that, um, but the awesome part is you guys went out and just basically jumped in and did this on your own, and you guys are basically able to do whatever you want with this film and not be like, hey, we need to get we need to get so and so to do this part because they're popular or something like that. I mean, I yeah. And in retrospect, I'm really realizing that I'm kind of like looking back on it, like, man, you know, like we actually had a lot more creative control in this film than a lot of people ever get. You know, it's like we were able to cast who we wanted. We didn't have, like you said, an executive or a studio that was saying like, it's Nicolas Cage or nothing. <laughs> but I don't like Nicolas Cage. He's not right for the part. And they're like, Nicolas Cage or no movie. Like we didn't have to deal with that, you know? And so looking back on it it's like wow that was like really cool like we really got to like shape this world into like what we wanted to be um really the only thing that prevented us you know from doing anything and everything we wanted was money we just didn't have as much money as other people so decisions had to be made you know to where you can fit the vision within a budget the thing about that is though is again looking back on it i'm like it really wasn't that limiting i mean we maybe didn't get to do some of the things that we would have loved to do, like some of the grandiose shots or push the gore as hard as we wanted to. And we might have had to shoot a few scenes a little bit faster than we would have liked or hoped. But overall, you know, it's like we can kind of choose like, hey, we want to work with this person and we want to shoot here. And we think this is more important than that. And I like this and I don't like that. So it was kind of nice, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So Nicolas Cage isn't in your movie. <laughs> Nicholas Cage is not in this movie. I mean, uh, no. I mean, I've I've heard he's like pretty broke right now. You could have probably got him for a dirt cheap uh, deal. I mean, <laughs> it's interesting because like, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm with you. I feel like Nicholas is one of those actors that if he likes the script and you reach out to him, I mean, he'll do it. You know, he'll jump on board. So, which surprisingly, a lot of these uh, perceivably really famous actors, they'll do it. You know, I mean, um, they're people too. They're artists too, and it's like. If you catch their interest with something and you have a good production strategy and uh, you connect with them and they connect with the material, a lot of times like it's it's surprisingly realistic to get them to at least entertain the idea of, of being in your project, you know? Yeah, the fun, the uh, that reminds me of um, something. It's, it's, it's pretty recently. There's this um, I ran across like a music. Vid it was actually it wasn't the music video first, but it was an actual song. And it was about Gary Hindick. It was a serial killer. Okay. And I'm sitting here listening to the song, and they're like, they're like singing this address. And I mean, it was kind of like, I don't know, it was kind of weird. But then all of a sudden, I start hearing Jonathan Davis from Corn Belting Out in this song, and I go, huh. I go, what? I go, what the hell am I listening to here? Then, because I just some, some days I, I just let things go out on random, you, you know, like right, right, right. Pick, pick a different station and be like, hey, play this type of music or this, that, and another. And I'm like, then it came on again, and I was like, I gotta stop and see what this is. And I'm looking at it, and I go, what the hell is this? <laughs> I looked it up, and it was um, it's this group called Skinned, S K Y N D, okay. and okay. they've based all their songs around like true crime stories. And really? Jonathan, yeah, yeah. And uh, Jonathan Davis like heard what they're doing and jumped on board and did this song with them. Dude, so, that's crazy. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, yeah, you, there's so much stuff out there like that. And then to, to me, one of the things that's so fascinating about it is like, how do the legalities of that work? Like, if you're basing your songs on like 
real serial killers and true crimes, what are the legalities as far as like the rights to those stories? And it's, is, is it like, is there kind of like a, a freedom of speech element or licensure that plays into it to where it's like, well, this is my interpretation of it, but it's not like factual. It's just like, it's, it's fascinating. And then, like you said, you get some of these huge people jumping on board is really cool. You know? Well, the thing is the, the, the what 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 even is uh, crazier about it? They're uh, they're from Australia, so I'd have no clue how they go about it. <laughs> Dude, they might just be like hidden in like the the bush somewhere, like recording these like albums and dropping them online, and nobody can even find them to like do anything, you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the full story, but they've got their their music videos are pretty crazy. I mean, they've done a song about Jim Jones. Um, huh. Uh, the Tyler Hadley, I think that's the last name. Richard Ramirez. Um, wow, Elisa, I Elisa all, Lamb. Yeah, I mean, all the big guys. I mean, I, I don't think there could be like a whole lot of legalities with it if it's they're actually writing. I mean, they don't sit there and copy. They form a song around the events that happened. I mean, you, you you ought to really just check it out, and you you'll be like, oh, this is because uh, it's not like scripted, but it's like they use parts and events of what happened, and uh, huh, that's super interesting. I'm yeah, definitely gonna yeah. check that I'm, out. I'm actually I'm work I'm working on something myself right now. Yes, sinners out there, Father Sin is working on something for you. He's working on a couple parody songs for you as well, but um i dig i dig i digress on that right now <laughs> yeah no no that's i mean that's that's so. super interesting like i'll definitely look it up and i mean i guess kind of two is one of the things that's interesting how many people are really fascinated with like the macabre and horror and how it kind of like translates from like film to literature to music and just uh and even just to interactive events you know it's like uh haunted houses and different things like that it's it's yeah, interesting yeah. kind of the psychology behind it, like how it appeals to so many people and inspires so much art and then also just draws such an audience, you know? Yeah, but back in the day when we were in school, we, we would have been made fun of over that shit. Oh, yeah, dude, like super nerds, like people would have been like <laughs> completely mocking us and we probably would have had to go talk to the guidance counselor because we were troubled youth, you know? It was, <laughs> it was a lot different back then, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's always a fascination with it, but I, I, I think it's it's um, so open right now, and um, everywhere you turn, it, it it doesn't matter TV, podcast, uh, YouTube, or whatever, you, you're gonna find all this stuff based around true crime and stuff like that, and it's like, what yeah. the shit. Yeah, I don't know. You're right. I mean, it's true. I mean, I guess when we were growing up, you know, it's like we had unsolved mysteries and and that was pretty creepy. Um, and we had a couple of like the true crime shows, you know, it's like you'd see stuff on Dateline and, and different things. But it is interesting, I guess, how much of it, it there is now and how much of an audience it draws. And I mean, also, I think like in a fictional sense, like when you get back to films and stuff, it's like how they push the boundaries like more and more and more you know it's like to me a lot of like horror at least in film it ends up being like very exploitational it's so like uh gratuitous and like the violence and the gore and uh the sex and they just keep heightening it and i what's interesting about it to me is i think in some ways it actually like lessens it because you lose a bit of the emotional connection to it you know you're not going for like, oh, I care about this character and I don't want anything to happen to them. And that's where the fear is based out of. It's almost more of just like a, trying to get a rise out of somebody for, from shock value, you know? And I think it's kind of like interesting how maybe the philosophy, I don't know, if maybe that's always been the philosophy and I'm just disillusioned now, but I think it's a little bit interesting how, how much that maybe has changed throughout even like the course of our lives, you know? I don't think you're disillusioned. I think... Like you and me are probably desensitized to to some of the stuff, you know. Well, that's probably true and, too. Yeah, and, and I I, I kind of think like society in general is becoming more desensitized to that type of material as well. Yeah, um, for sure. And I I think a lot of it's just even like we we were talking about with like you know be it podcasts or YouTube videos and the internet, just exposure. You know, it's like you can literally find anything out there right now, and it's 
it's weird how when people, I think, view something remotely, um, they watch a YouTube video. It's like they experience it on a level that still maybe like is very personal to them. So in a way, they feel like they've been exposed to it. They feel like they've experienced it, even though they weren't there in person. And of course, there's going to be like different variables when you're there in person as opposed to like watching it through a video. But to your point, I think it builds up our tolerance to everything and it just conditions us to such a radical degree that maybe society on a whole is becoming desensitized to a lot of the acts of violence and a lot of the, uh, the just crazy things that happen in the world, you know? Yeah. That brings me to like another point too. I, I, I think it makes a lot of people lazy though, too, because you got people that just sit and watch people play video games on there or kids opening up toys and stuff like that. And I'm like, what the hell is this shit? Yeah. I'm, and I'm with you. And maybe this is like, again, uh, playing to our age a little bit. <laughs> I really can't wrap my head around the kind of living vicariously through a video or someone else's experience. Like I will never understand, like you said, the package opening phenomenon where it's like people are watching or watching someone else play video games it's like okay i can get that you might want to check in on a video game video to see how somebody gets past a certain point or to learn a particular strategy but to sit there and watch these kids like play role-playing games or whatever for like hours on end i in no way shape or form can i understand that. it's like why don't you just play the game yourself and what do you get out of it by watching that that you wouldn't get out of it by just playing it yourself and experiencing it literally through first person as opposed to watching someone you know yeah we sound like a couple old hags john i know this is what happens i mean this is what <laughs> happens you you know you're young and you're cool and you're like down with the system and then a few years later you're like man everything's changing and it doesn't make sense and this sucks and it's happened to like every generation before us and now it's happening to you and i too ray yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> oh, man. That's why. That's why I always tell people I go. I'm just an asshole. Just bear bear with me. I'm an asshole. <laughs> I'll entertain you though. I will entertain you. That's so. a, and that's all you can do. I think, and that's something else that's interesting with the world today. It's just like owning stuff. Like you remember how when we were kids, it's like everything wasn't like diagnosed. It was just like. Oh yeah, that old lady's meaner than hell. Or it's like, yeah, that guy's a jerk. Or it's yeah. like, yeah, they're super nervous. It wasn't like all this stuff of like everybody had ADHD or everybody was like bipolar or depressed. It was literally just like, oh yeah, the mean dude that lives down the street. And you're like, yeah, yeah. And so it's like, yeah, I've got, I've got anger management problems, man. I just got a bad temper on me, you know. Like, oh yeah, cool. <laughs> so I'm with you on that, you know. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Maybe we're the last generation that's just like, yeah, I'm just a jump. That's all there is to it, you know? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's uh, that's the scary part of it. It was like there's I – th I think the only labels back in the day was like nerd, jock, hood, hoodlum, stuff like that. And it's like, yep. Uh... It kind of tied you to your social – your social like uh... – status and right. i guess where you came from but in a way there wasn't even really anything that derogatory about it it was just like how you define people you know it's like i was kind of a hillbilly or a hick and it's like i don't <laughs> take offense to it you know it's like yeah i'm a country boy like i'm in four h i grew up on a farm like what do you want from me you know that's, that's who i am and so and the hoods were hoods and they didn't care the jocks were jocks and they didn't care it's like but now, like, everybody is, and this is weird because I guess it goes against what we were saying about society being desensitized on some level, which I fully think it is. And then I think what you see is the overcompensation for that by being overly sensitive about everything to where it's just now a complete, like, oh, don't label anyone. Like, don't use titles. Like, everything's offensive. And it's like, oh, man, I feel like you can't say anything in this day and age. Well, well, we, we can't even be gender specific anymore. It's either they or them now. That's true too. That's true too. That's a rough, that's a rough one, man. It's all these topics are so sensitive and, and it's interesting too, because I think for, I mean, I don't know, but for you as a podcast interviewer and for me as a filmmaker, you know, it's, it's a really challenging time in navigating a lot of these issues, be it through conversation or through story types or, you know, the, the media that we produce, because I mean, God forbid you say the wrong thing. It's like, they'll, 
they'll burn you at the stake just like they did at the Salem witch trials or back in medieval times even. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know what? I, I, I just had a revelation the other day. I'm like, you know what? I'm old enough. Fuck it. <laughs> you don't if you don't like it you ain't gonna listen to me and you know what you're gonna go say a bunch of bad stuff and all that all you're doing is gonna bring more attention to me so yeah i'm, I'm just gonna cut loose so yeah no it's true and it isn't a bad philosophy and it is interesting because it works for a lot of people in a lot of ways you know it's like i, I always look at south park like still going like strong and it's like one of the most offensive shows ever conceived but also one of the funniest shows ever uh conceived and there's a lot of truth in it you know it's like they they do such a good job of just like pointing out the absurdism of so many of the the things that we're dealing with in this country in the world that i think i mean i don't know i just i think it's it's an interesting like you said like they just are wholly committed to it that's the direction they go and everybody pretty much leaves them alone like yeah that's what those guys are doing you know and then there's other people that are maybe trying to appease the masses and those are the ones that end up getting burned, burned at the stake, you know? Right. Well, I also think a lot of the stuff is, uh, media overblowing stuff, you know, uh, anything, anything that comes up. Well, so-and-so said this on social media and it, it gets on the news and whatever. And it, then it's such a big deal, but really social media is what two, 3% of the population actually. That's supposedly, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the exact percentage is, but it's insanely low. I mean, you feel like when you're on there, it's the whole world and the whole world is on there. But to your point, like I, I had come across something not too long ago that suggested what you just said, where it's like it's an insanely low percentage of the population that's actually on social media and regularly active on it. But when you're on it, man, it's like the whole universe, you know? <laughs> right, right. I mean, uh, how does that play out with, like, the type of career you're in now? I mean... You know, it, that's it, it's interesting. I think that it's like... I think it's a pro and it's a con. And, I mean, I think that in, in talking about, you know, getting older and, and becoming the grumpy, you know, old dudes that we once so much loathed or whatever, our <laughs> variation of that, every generation's had their challenges. and And the thing that made it difficult for them to succeed in any particular like career or facet of life. And in the thing that the advantage they had that that allowed them to succeed. So with filmmaking, it's the same thing, man. It's like, there are a lot of people out there that are complaining that, you know, the economics of the film industry are worse than they've ever been before because the, the, the market is so oversaturated with films and it's so oversaturated with films because of the digital revolution like now everybody has access to the technology to make these films, whereas before no one did. Like unless you went to film school, unless you were equipped to handle, you know, the the tools that were necessary to shoot a film on film, you couldn't do it. So there were a lot of people out there that just did not know how to do it. So there were a lot less films being made and there was a lot less ways to show those films. You know, it wasn't so long ago that the only way you could see a a movie was to actually go to the movie theater. And then, okay, they brought it into our homes with VHS. And I think something weird right before VHS, um, Uh, Betamax, there you go. Betamax. And then it's VHS and then it's DVD. So, okay, now we can take it home, but we're still limited to like a unit by unit, like, uh, exchange of currency to where it's like, you have to get that DVD. You have to get that Blu-ray. The internet doesn't exist. And the people that are making the not Blu-ray, sorry, DVD VHS. And the people then that are making the films, they're still basically shooting on film. There's very little that you can do outside of film and trying to make a movie. Then all of a sudden everything goes digital. And then it, it becomes so evolved that it's like every kid can basically shoot a film on their iPhone 10 or 11 and throw it on their like MacBook Pro, and they can literally like make a film. So then, you know, with that comes the internet, and you've got your your VOD platforms, which a lot of the ones that are subscriber based, their bread and butter is just like the the quantity of films that they have. They constantly have to have new content, so you can find a home for these things. So what does that do? It like actually drives the price 
of the product down in the market. And you hear everybody complaining like, oh, you can't make money with it. You can't make money with it. It's really hard, da, 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 da. Okay, it is hard. It's hard to stand out in an oversaturated market. It's hard to figure out how to make money with it. But on the flip side and getting back to the social media thing, you have a direct like line of contact now between the person who's making the films and the person who's consuming the films. Like you have the ability to reach your audience directly. It's like you have an ability to distribute your film directly if you so choose. You have the ability to like get the technology and have it in your house or in your hand at any given time. So there's actually a lot of advantages to it that the prior generations didn't have. Really, the only trick then is overcoming the economics. Like, how do you position a project so that it has the potential to like make money? How do you reach an audience that is large enough that the film can get a return on the investment? And when I started making Animal Among Us, my definition of like the art of filmmaking was literally the art of filmmaking. It was like, how well is the script written and how do you shoot it? And what are the best shots and how do you edit it? How does it sound? It was literally all of the artistry in the process. As I've come out on the other side of that, I've come to realize that like the art of filmmaking is actually like that perfect point where you balance the art with the business. And when you can balance the art with the business, you then have mastered the art of filmmaking because at the end of the day it takes money to make art and art can make money but if you can't find that balancing point it's going to be a really really tricky road and uh so for me you know it's like with the social media thing i think it's a blessing and a curse i think it's a pro and a con because it's like people are hypercritical um, everybody's trying to make these films and put them out on social media and put them out on different VOD platforms. And there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of people talking out there. Um, and it just then becomes a question of like, how do you use it to your advantage? And, and also how do you not let it like kind of come back and cut your legs out from under you by making a foolish mistake? So, I mean, I, I do only try to be very like aware of what I'm saying on social media and what I'm presenting on social media because at the end of the day, it's like if you are going to move up in the world, it's like none of these studios or bigger production companies or people that you might partner with, be it investors or or just other production members, like they're not going to partner with you if they feel like you're a huge liability. Um, because at the end of the day, like it's a it's a very risky, very delicate endeavor, and one little thing can kind of like knock the whole house of cards down, you know. So. I just try to use it to my advantage, get the word out about the film, um, get people interested, network as much as possible, find people to potentially collaborate with. Um, and I, I basically keep most of my personal life and my political perspectives off of it, you know, just because you can never make anybody, everybody happy, like what you said earlier. And so it's like, hey, I'm just going to use it in the way I need it. And outside of that, it it doesn't have much of an impact on my life. Right. Right. So, oh, you brought that movie up again, and I, I, I keep looking at different stuff on here. You got a very um, interesting uh, actor on that yeah. film. Several, yeah, several. I think I know who you're talking about, though. Probably the one that caught your eye was Don Fry, huh? Yeah, Don Fry. Yeah, so um, great guy, uh, UFC heavyweight champ of the world a couple times, um, also very successful in Pride and K1 and currently in the UFC Hall of Fame and known as, you know, one of the world's toughest men ever in the history of the world. And I was fortunate enough to meet him on a film I was working on way back in the early 2000s. And he was still fighting back then. And I was... Uh, working on some films as an actor and back in that day and age i was modeling and uh i got a contract over in japan so i went to japan and he would go over to japan a lot and fight and do big time wrestling so a couple times i was over there and he came over to fight and so i'd go watch his fight and hang out with him while he was over there and we just became really good friends and always stayed in touch and when i started making my own films he was gracious enough to uh come be in one of my short films you know it's like just as a buddy i mean we didn't have any money it was me and a few of my friends mainly local people from ohio that wanted to shoot this short film and we're like hey man you know we wrote this role for you and i'm gonna shoot it over the course of like seven days like 
come out and, and hang out with us. And he's like, yeah, he's like, get my plane ticket. Phoebe. He's like, I'm down. So he came out and did that. Um, and then it was just amazing because when this film finally, like it got financed and it was happening, we had this role for him that was just perfect. And it was great to just be able to call him up and be like, Hey man, I've got a role for you in like a real film with legitimate cast. Like, do you want it? Can you do it? And he was like, I'll be there. And so super cool to have Don Fry in it, you know? Yeah. I, so was he over there doing pancreation matches or was he doing like the uh, Japanese wrestling over there? He actually did both. Um, he oh, did the wow. Japanese, yeah. He did the big time wrestling over there. I think he played a heel most of the time. And then he would go over there and he would do uh, cage fights. And then he would also do more kind of like, kickboxing and mma but in more of a boxing style ring right and um yeah i mean just you know I, if there's a fight like don fry's in it he doesn't really care <laughs> you know he, he's not real like chrissy when it comes to like the rules i mean he just wants to get in there and fight and so it's it's something to watch him fight i mean it's it's nerve-wracking you know because i mean you're just like you know he's one of the greatest there ever was but you're still like man you just don't want to see him get like torn up you know and yeah yeah and well, I mean, spe about, especially with like you having you having a connection with him so yeah I mean, and I, the thing of it is too is like you know it, and it's kind of like in us talking about things changing you know it's like i on the one hand it's like when you go back and you watch like the old nfl football games and you go back and you watch the old fights you know it's like they didn't have the rules to protect like players and fighters like they do now. And there's always the debate of like, well, was it better back then or was it better now? And I mean, Fry, like he, he definitely like paid a price for the fights that he fought. And I, I do think in a way now that they like kind of call the, the fights a little bit quicker, if they like think that the fighters defenseless, like even for a second, if the hands drop or something, it's like they call the fight. I think it actually, does a tremendous amount to like preserve those guys and, and, and their health. Because I mean, when you're sitting there watching it, man, it's like, you just don't realize like the damage that these guys are inflicting on each other, you know? And, um, same with the football players. I mean, it's just, it's just interesting. It's like back in the day when there was nothing to really protect the wide receivers, nothing to really protect the quarterbacks. It's like, just run up and blast some dude, you know, between the numbers when he's not looking. <laughs> it's right. Like, it's totally cool, which makes you go back and you look at guys like Jerry Rice and you look at guys like Terry Bradshaw and you're just like, man, how did you do what you did for as long as you did it? Because <laughs> no one was doing you any favors to protect you, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. But on the other hand, it's it's there's a part of me now, I guess, since I've gotten older, that I'm like kind of glad that, that they, they take some measures to try to protect these guys so that they can walk when they're 50, you know? Yeah, I mean that that that, that CTE stuff, man. That, that's that's be, be, becoming a huge thing, and finding out that's caused a lot of issues with uh, football players, wrestlers, boxers, and MMA yeah. fighters. And that's a that's a huge thing. And I mean, if you think about it again, like I don't know how much stuff changes in such a short period of time, and a lot of that, I guess, is due to technology. But it's like. I mean, when we were kids and it's like we were playing football and we were wrestling and stuff, and just fighting the fight. It's like you you didn't have a clue, you know, that it's like nobody did like parents or or anybody coaches like they didn't have a clue of like what the repercussions of that could be. And it is sad now to your point, like when you see that, and you're like, man, it's like these, these people didn't know. You know, it's like you think you're playing football or you're, you're in MMA or you're a boxer and that's like healthy um, and to a degree it is healthy. But you got to kind of find that balance and it's good that people are, are becoming more aware of that so they can navigate it and keep some of these people from getting messed up, you know? Yeah. I mean, you don't want to be a pudding brain. Yeah, no. And, <laughs> or, or worse, you know what I mean? That's where like with Fry, this guy's so tough that, uh, so we're shooting the film and one of the first days that we shoot, um, there's a scene where, he basically like he's he's trying to dispose of the dead bodies of two young girls. So there's and dead bodies in your movie. There's a couple like dead bodies in the movie, yeah. And <laughs> in this in this instance, it's it's two young girls because basically uh, the premise of the film is that 15 years ago, two girls got killed at this sleepaway camp, and it was never really conclusively like 
the case never really conclusively came to a close. So they, they kind of just ruled it an animal attack and swept it under the rug. Well, this dude writes a speculative novel on what he thinks really happened at this camp. And he basically pins it all on the owners of the camp. And now 15 years later, uh, the campground is reopening and they invite this author, this guy that wrote this book back to the camp to celebrate the grand reopening and something horrible still waits in the woods. So throughout the film, you get little glimpses back to 15 years ago to what happened. And of course, the, the killing of these two girls was very real. We just don't know the truth behind it. So we show you some stuff throughout the film to give you some hints. And one of the first scenes we shot was Don Fry, and he's got these two dead bodies. And one's already laid on the ground. The other one he has up on his shoulder and kind of like is supposed to kneel down and then like lay her down and kind of start to dispose of these bodies. And I can tell like when he picked her up, man, he was like sweating a lot. And it's like, he's kind of pale white and he just didn't look real good. And this is a guy that's never going to tell you that something hurts. He's never going to tell you what's wrong, but I could tell that like he was, he was having some trouble with it. So I was like, man, I was like, I don't know what's up with Fry. You know, I knew he had his knees were kind of rough and he had some back issues and stuff. So I just decided to change the shot. You know, it's, it's a movie. So I'm like, hey, I'm like, this isn't really working with you having the girl on your shoulder. Like, why don't we just have you like kneeling down on your knees and then you just kind of like finish the action of laying her on the ground. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, that works. That's cool. So we go on and we shoot this whole movie. Uh, we shoot, I think, 15 days this time that he was involved and never complains, never says a word. And we get done filming. And a few days later, he shoots me a text with a photograph in it. And it turns out that he had had several vertebrae in his back fused together. So basically, there's like a, a titanium rod that runs up your back between the vertebrae, like on each side of whatever that fin is on the center of your vertebrae. And then it's screwed in from vertebrae to vertebrae to like fuse them together. Right. Right. The whole time we were shooting that movie, this dude had two broken titanium rods that were screwed to his spine that were literally snapped in half sticking out. Like you would break a number two pencil sticking out, like into the muscle and just like all of like the flesh in his back and dude shot the entire movie like that. Just like, yeah, my back was bothering me a little bit, but, you know, we had to get through the movie. So <laughs> no sooner we get done shooting, he had to go in for surgery. And I mean, they had to open him up from his shoulder blades, like kind of down to his tailbone and go in and fix those broken rods. It's a major surgery. It's a major thing. But just kind of, again, a testament as to like how tough this guy is. Um, never, never complained once, never said a thing, you know, just just toughed out the whole shoot. So. And also going back to like just how rough some of these sports could be on these athletes before they took the precautionary measures to protect them. You know, it's, it's pretty crazy. That's, that's crazy. Like he's walking around with these broken rods in his back and he's just like, Oh, well, let's just, let's keep filming this. Let's keep going. Yeah. And I mean, he's, <laughs> he's like, he's such a nice guy, uh, which is funny. Cause I mean, when you watch him fight, of course, like, again, he's just like, absolutely a, like an animal but yeah that's like, what i was gonna talk, say yeah it's like you you talk to the guy and it's like you get to know him i mean he's got horses it's like he's got a couple dogs it's like he's had a pot belly pig he's got two daughters that he loves to death and it's like he's an absolute sweetheart and so the whole time on the film it's like of course he's great to work with he's like you know one of my closest friends and just a great guy. He's like a favorite amongst the cast and crew, but you know, you're, you're shooting this thing for 15 days. It's like, you're not running on a lot of sleep. It starts to get a little bit tedious. A lot of times you're doing the same thing over and over and over. And from the outsider's perspective, you know, it's like filmmaking was like, Oh, it's like a super fun, exciting adventure, man. People are drinking a lot of coffee on those things. Not only just because of like sleep deprivation, but also because it's so redundant and repetitive and tedious. So it's like right. by the end of like a shoot, like tempers are starting to wear a little bit thin. So we were shooting this like really intense scene. And, we some and he kind of got frustrated and he kind of like took a shot at me like in a take, you know, he kind of like ad-libbed like a little bit of an insult. 
and it wasn't even anything anything bad. It was just something like all hail like King Woodruff, you know, like the know it all of the filmmaking industry or something. So we're just like, oh, cut, let's do it again. I didn't even say anything. This poor guy like has been apologizing to me about that ever since we shot. Like every time I talk to him, he's like, oh, cowboy. I'm sorry about that, man. That just really wasn't cool. And I'm like, dude, it's totally okay. I'm like, you were shooting with two broke rods in your back. Like, yeah, you might have been a little bit, like, grumpy, you know? And he just doesn't see it like that, man. He's just like, oh, was so disrespectful. I should have done that, cowboy. And um, so it's just like, again, like a testament to just kind of how great of a guy he is, you know? It's like he doesn't even really get grumpy or angry, like, throughout the whole shoot in spite of like the amount of pain that he's in and the tedious nature of it. And one time he kind of mouths off and he's still apologizing for it all this time later. It's cause he's, he's so nice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's awesome, man. That's sounds like you built a, a awesome friendship with him as well. Yeah. He's, he's a good guy and he's one of my closest friends and really glad we got to bring him onto the project. We had a lot of great actors on it. Uh, Heather Tom, who's, huge on the soaps she's won five emmys uh big on the bold and the beautiful and both really? and the restless yeah and that was it was really cool to get to work with her she had family in ohio and we were able to work it out with the schedule to where she could come in and shoot for a day and she was basically in a flashback scene so we brought her in and it was so funny because it was again one of the first scenes that uh that we were shooting so i was actually pretty nervous because when they shoot soaps, they are on it, man. They've got this thing down to a system. So it's like they can shoot pages and pages and pages a day. And it's like they don't miss a beat. So this actress is coming out and she's got all of these Emmys and I'm a first time director. And so I'm a little bit nervous. I mean, this was maybe like day two that we were shooting her scene. She shows up. She's already in wardrobe. She's like, hey, da, 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 da. let's talk through the scene. We walk through the blocking. We rehearse camera a couple of times. Like, OK, you need a break or um, you know, how are you feeling? She's like, no, let's do it. It's like, all right, cool. So we start rolling on this thing and it's a pretty long scene, probably seven or eight pages and there's movement in it. And there's action in it. And we're shooting it in the top of this, like old, like, like early 1800s, like stone, like tavern. And it's really hot up there. And it looks awesome because everybody's kind of like glistening and everything, but it's hot. So we're like doing this. And I'm like, hey, you need to take a break? She's like, no, I'm good. Like, let's just keep going. Just like powered through it. And that scene was her and, and Don Fry and the two dead bodies. So we power through this scene. And I mean, she's like, okay, great. You got everything you need? And we're like, yep. She's like, all right, great. I look forward to seeing the film. And she was like, go on, you know, didn't even really get to say goodbye to her or anything or thanks. Just like in and out and so professional, like didn't drop a line, hit her mark every time, gave the performance of a lifetime. And it was just like one of those moments where you're like, oh man, that just happened. And I totally forgot to like appreciate it or get a photo or anything, you know? So it was, it was crazy, man, but I gotta have her on, gotta have Larissa Olenek, um, who was the real Alex Mack when we were little kids in the secret world of Alex Mack and she was also Bianca and 10 things I hate about you. And she's like our leading lady. So phenomenal actress, like made my job super easy, always hits the mark, always knows where her eye line is. Um, she'll give you multiple takes. Each take is different enough to give you variety, but her continuity is good enough that you could pick any part of any take and edit it together to get a really versatile performance. So She's phenomenal. Um, Christian Oliver, our lead guy, has been in everything you've ever heard of, and he was great. And so, yeah, it was just really cool to have this really experienced cast um, with all of these, like, major credits uh, coming together for this this film, you know. And it, I think it really shows in the finished product just um, the, the, what they're able to bring to it, you know, and really bring the story to life. So it sounds to me you hired all these great actors and you didn't have to do any work at all. Pretty much, man. I mean, they <laughs> say, I mean, they say that like one of the most important things in filmmaking is casting. Of course, you know, of course it's the story, but then it's the casting. It's who you get to play the role. Are they easy to work with? Are they hard to work with? They can make a director and an editor's job the easiest thing in the world, or they can make it the hardest thing in the world. And to your point, like, yeah, dude, this was like, 
for me as a director, thank God they were as good as they were because there were so many other things that I was having to try to like deal with and make work outside of like the actors that had, they needed more direction and more help. Um, it, it could have went really horribly awry, but they were so good that, yeah, they made my job like super easy. It's like, as long as the camera's recording and the shots in focus, they're going to give you something great and make you look like a rock star, you know? So <laughs> right. that, they helped me out a lot. Man, this, this, this film sounds awesome. I, I've, I've already checked the trailer out. Um, when can people expect to start being able to see this movie, John? So I, you know, I'm not like really like allowed to say yet. Um, but what I can tell you is just that we're working super close with our sales agent, our distributor right now. And I think that 2019 that we're coming down to the last quarter, is going to be a very fun, very exciting, like last few months to the year. So so just like stay tuned and and hang in there for 2019 and um and i think that uh you know i think the question will be answered yeah because uh it's, it's not too far away it's gonna be christmas time soon man yeah it's gonna be super super close to christmas and so i think that you know for everybody involved in animal among us it'll be uh, a merry christmas indeed um and, and a fun few weeks leading up to it <laughs> so i think can yeah. i do that can i basically like tell you when it's being released without telling you when it's uh, being released i like, have no clue what you're saying man i'm i'm, I'm just uh yeah we're just talking in abstract terms right now yeah you know? that's right man <laughs> man I, i'm i'm really excited for you man this is this is really big i, I just uh, it's crazy I, well, someone thanks. i went I to high school it. with is doing this and you said you've been involved in some other short films. Is any of that stuff available for people to check out or, you know, it's interesting. Like I, I basically made like the short films that I like wrote and produced and directed. My intention in doing that was just to kind of like create a body of work that I could use, um, to demonstrate that I had the capacity to do a feature film. Like that was my motivation. That was my intention from like the first short film I ever shot. And so the first one I shot was called Reflections. It was way back in like maybe 2008. Um, I shot it with my girlfriend at the time and two of my closest friends, one from Columbus, Ohio, and the other one from Cincinnati, Ohio. But we shot it in New York City um, because we were three of the four of us were based out of, out of New York. And it's kind of a very impressionistic like – uh, romanticized drama and like softcore porn. Yeah, basically. And, uh, you know, you know, I mean, a, a good reason for my girlfriend and I to act in it and for me to direct it. <laughs> so you tell everybody what to do. Um, and your, your two weird buddies watching everything through a camera, completely natural. <laughs> so, uh, so we shot this thing over the course of a weekend. It's called reflections. I think if you go to my IMDB page and you click on meteor videos, I think somehow, it's linked and I think it's on there. But what's interesting is, so it was all, it was pretty much all shot in a very controlled environment, very drama based, very low key. So I did that to kind of show, to demonstrate that I could handle drama and, and everything. So then the next film I did was a short film with Don Fry. We shot it in Michigan in March because we wanted the snow at night. We did it as a period piece. Um, and so I wanted to show that I could shoot stuff like, outdoors in like a difficult location um and and make it work and have more action sequences so that was the second film we did and that was called within and my idea with doing those was that i could demonstrate like a capacity to handle the source material be it from a controlled environment to uh, a more difficult environment and so beyond that i never really did much with those films like i never posted them on youtube never really put them out there to the world but what's funny where i'm going with this long-winded answer is now that animals getting ready to come out i've had some people reach out to me inquiring about other projects and so i'm actually talking to a guy right now um about a new vod platform that they're getting ready to launch and they want to have a short film section and they want to they're interested in throwing my short films up on it so i'm hoping here you know within the next few months or year or so that those short films will be readily available to the public through this this new vod platform that these guys are developing 
Yeah, well, I remember seeing like a clip, and I remember one of them. I don't know which one it was, but it was, uh, you said something. I think Brookville, Ohio was involved in it or somehow. There's a line. You were actually in the film. Oh, so, okay. So you're probably thinking of a feature film that I did years ago um, with a producer out of Indiana. And he never finished the film. But in that, we did have a reference that the character was like from Brookville. And so you it's very possible and i think that that was like in the trailer um which was online for quite some period of time so i would bet that that's what you're thinking of (laughs) and that's a super interesting story because i was very close with that guy i learned a tremendous amount about producing films through that guy um and we set out to make this film and we shot the whole thing and he did the initial edit um got the rough cut together cut a trailer which the trailer was really nice we dropped the trailer online and then he just never finished the film and so it never saw the light of day which obviously was like insanely disappointing and and maddening so i tried for a long time to get him to kind of turn the film over to some of the investors and some of the people involved with the film so that we could finish it and get it out there to the world he just wasn't willing to do it and During that time, I transitioned out to Los Angeles, started working with an ex-studio head, um, learning a tremendous amount, and was able to get Animal Among Us up and on its feet. And so I kind of had to have this, like, come to Jesus moment, for lack of a better phrase at this point in the conversation, um, and be like, am I going to continue to, like, fight backwards and try to, like, get this movie away from this guy and get it out there to the world? Or am I going to like fight forward and try to like progress and, and, you know, just move away from this. And so it was a really tough thing for me to do because I finished what I start, man. And I I think, you know how that is. I mean, it's like, we, we grew up in Brookville, Ohio. It's like, that's pounded into you from the time that you're a little kid. It's like, you finish what you start, what you start. And, um, you know, you keep your word and you put your money where your mouth is. So it was a really hard thing for me to let go of. Um, but looking back on it now, I think it was the right decision and in, in moving forward with animal among us and being able to step more into like a leadership position. I have the ability, I have the control to make sure that that project's going to get done and to deliver a level of quality that does the people involved with the film, like justice for their time, effort and their talent, you know? And, uh, so, yeah, so that's, but I'm sure that that's the film that you're thinking of where Brookville was mentioned and I was actually in the film. It's yeah, the one that never yeah. Got finished. yeah, you were in it. That's why I brought it up. I, I, I can't remember if I, I don't know where I ran across it. I remember running across it. I go, holy shit, that's Woody. Yeah. I go, I Woody's bet- in a movie. Yeah, I would have to say that you <laughs> saw the trailer because it, it got, it got some decent visibility, man. Like it was, you know, it was, uh, this guy had, had been a relatively accomplished producer for a short period of time and he was good at work in the local media. I mean, back then it's like we were on the, uh, the frontier of the internet being accessible to, you know, <laughs> yeah. private homes. So, you know, it's like, I mean, we're talking like, I don't even want to say, but there was still even then a lot of stuff in the newspapers and then the internet was still pretty young. And so it was, a lot less content out there at that time. I'm, I'm guessing that that's what you saw that mentioned Brookfields in it. So yeah, pretty, pretty yeah. funny, man. Yeah. But then I started, uh, seeing this other stuff and, uh, I can't remember how long ago I saw, sorry, you started posting about, uh, animal among us and I just saw you were in, uh, what was it? Whorehound fest. Yep. Yep. So, that's yeah. And again, this is, this is kind of funny. I talked about this in a podcast last week, but six degrees of separation. Um, basically, you know, you remember, uh, Bart Clemmer from yeah, Brookville. Yeah. Um, so Bart, he lives in LA and I was in New York and transitioning to LA. So went out there and it was actually Bart that introduced me to the person that had the script that Jonathan Murphy had written. So I actually was introduced to animal among us through kind of like a connection of someone that literally grew up like a quarter mile down the street from me. And we rode the school bus together when we were in first grade. So that's kind of like how it started. And then amazingly enough, the way that it ended and the way that we ended up getting 
exposed to horror hound was I was home for Christmas and Jeremy Brookshire, who grew up right across the street, was also home for Christmas. So I I finished the trailer for Animal Among Us. The movie was pretty close to being finished. Um, And so I walked across the street to show him and his family the trailer. And Jeremy loved it and was blown away by it. And so I was like, oh, my dude, like, I can't believe you made this. He's like, you got to go to Horror Hound. And I'm like, Horror Hound? I've heard of the magazine. And he's like, yeah, no, but he's like, they have this huge convention in the Midwest. That's where the, the magazine is based out of. So he introduced me to a guy, Joe Volman, um, who works closely with the Horror Hound guys. And uh, Joe made a connection to Horror Hound. And Horror Hound really responded well to the film. And they wanted to screen it at their festival that's associated with the convention. The film wasn't done. So he talked about how we could do it. And basically, um, we decided to do it as a test screening. So, you know, we show it in its incomplete form just to gauge audience response and different things like that. So we did that. We got a phenomenal response. Uh, it was it was such a strong response. We decided, like, OK, let's go ahead and lock picture. Um, and then all we have to really do is GFX, VFX, credit sequences, color grading, uh, finalize the score, dialogue edit. There's still a ton of stuff to do to finish the project. But we knew that it was basically where we needed it to be and that it was working. So we did that. And then since we're getting close to the release now, we actually came back to Horror Hounds this year. Um, and we got a booth just to kind of like spread the word of mouth of the film a little bit more, hand out some, you know, free art and Animal Among Us merch and different things like that and get people to be looking for the trailer. And uh, we'll have another trailer drop in here in a few weeks as we get closer to the release. So get people kind of like get their curiosity peaked for that. And so that's kind of like how the whole horror hound thing came around and it's interesting how it all started out. Like I became exposed to the project through someone from Brookville who would think, and then ended up getting connected to horror hounds through someone from Brookville as well. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's insane. I mean, that's, I don't never even thought about it. Um, I, I knew I ended up getting hooked up with another group. They were doing some advertisements for my, for the sinful company. And, um, actually get involved with them the gorgeous girls i believe they were out there okay uh, uh that's how i how i heard about whorehound which is it's, it's just funny it's it's just like the small similarities and things and it's just like how things just click and fire and oh, yeah i never heard about this and this this was a guy out of, he's out of heber heights that runs like an independent like uh magazine huh and uh they i think he goes there every year to promote his magazine and stuff that's super interesting. So, and I mean, yeah. To, and to what you just said, it is funny how things kind of like can just click and pop into place because I mean, as you know, growing up where we grew up and going to school where we went to school, it's like in a lot of ways, like we had it good. Like when you look back on it, it's like we had it pretty good and we were raised right, but we kind of had a lot of limitations as far as like exposure to different things outside of our area of the world and resources that people and, and bigger cities might have so it's like when we were growing up i mean i remember you like to draw a lot and i love to draw and you know it's like i was kind of like aspiring to be like a comic book illustrator or something like that i never had an inkling of an idea that it would be possible to be a filmmaker i think you know by the time i was kind of like a senior in high school it's like well maybe i could like be an illustrator maybe i could be an actor but again, like at that point, like the technology wasn't readily available. And I didn't know anybody that was like playing with, you know, uh, eight millimeter film or 16 millimeter film. I didn't know of film school. Like I didn't know how you made movies. Like it was just such a far off distant thing that it just didn't seem possible. So it never even crossed my mind, but strangely through kind of like the pursuit of art and illustration and, and like you said things kind of clicked and popped into place and if i could go back and talk to myself like freshman year of high school be like yeah man at some point you're going to be like a filmmaker be like what like how it seems like such an impossibility it was something that like had never even crossed my mind but just kind of a natural creative journey and evolution and it's been really cool and when we were getting ready to shoot animal like i said i produced it out of LA, but I brought it back to Ohio because I wanted to be able to utilize people 
from where we grew up and tell a story that took place in an area that I knew well, basically. Um, and it was like so rewarding because just like, kind of like everything clicked and I kind of had this moment of like, wow, like be it from art school to the modeling, to the acting, to growing up on a farm, to living in New York, to moving to LA, like everything I was exposed to in my life culminated in that moment. And as corny as it sounds, because of the inevitability of that, um, it just all clicked and it felt right. And it was like, I learned exactly what I needed to learn to be able to do this. Like I was equipped with the tools that I need to be able to like make this work. And it was all just kind of by chance in a way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, this was even a long time ago. I was, I was a school resource officer at, uh, at, at a high school and I ran into you, you're doing stuff with, uh, what was it? DC, DC, uh, Kai, it was with smarty pants, the improv company, which was affiliated a bit with DC, DC through muse machine. So Muse Muse Machine, Machine, okay. Yeah, in the Dayton area, Muse Machine um, would work with different groups. DC DC was one of them uh, that focused on, you know, modern contemporary dance. And then Smarty Pants, which was all about like the fundamental rules and philosophies of improvisation and how it can be advantageous in an educational system. And so we would go into schools and, you know, give shows and do workshops and different things like that. And yeah, that's when you and I bumped into each other. And again, I don't even want to say like how long ago that was, (laughs) but I mean, that was a minute ago. And even that, like the whole improv thing, like how it kind of like, played into the filmmaking like even at that point in my life i didn't know it was going to be possible going in and working with those kids and like um again the fundamentals the ideals the philosophies of improv are like super prevalent in filmmaking and your ability to evolve and adapt on a moment-to-moment basis like you stick to a plan um close enough to maintain sight of your vision but you have to be able to adjust regularly enough to to maintain progress uh because it's just it's a it's a very complex process with a lot of moving pieces and so it's never going to work out exactly how you planned it and a lot of times when it doesn't it's for the better i look back at animal and i'm like oh man if that would have went the way i wanted it to to go it would have been horrible like it wouldn't work nearly as good as it does this way so even going back to that yeah and i mean i i can't remember when that was we ran into each other back then you know Oh, it was, it was, <laughs> it was a good minute ago, but yeah. like from in between, like here and there, I mean, you said, um, you're out and, uh, you, you consult with scripts for fees and stuff like that. I mean, what were you doing back then to like get by and to pursue- mainly, yeah. So mainly with that, you know, it's like, it's been interesting when I was based out of New York, I was still doing improv. Um, I was auditioning a lot. I was really pushing the acting thing and that's when I was modeling. So it's like, you go overseas, you model in Japan or something, make some money, come back to New York. That would be your like, you know, living. Ex- so I was kind of making money that way. And, um, it was cool because I got to live all over the world. I lived in Osaka, Tokyo, Hong Kong, um, Istanbul, Milan. I got to spend some time in Brazil. So that was really amazing. And then one time when I was back in New York, um, I, an old college friend hit me up that was based out of Los Angeles. And they were working with an ex-studio head, um, who Tom Mount, who ran Universal Studios. And so they were going to be in New York on business. So I sat down with them and Tom was interested in my short films and kind of interested in what I was doing. And over the course of several meetings, he was like, Hey, why don't you come out to Los Angeles and work with me? So I went out, I worked with him for a little while, started doing the screenwriting consulting, started doing a lot of production gigs. So I would do assistant directing or I would do art department, uh, production management, production coordination, uh, different things like that to kind of like pay the bills. Um, sometimes I pick up handyman work here and there, you know, it's like, cause I don't know how to fix stuff. So I mean, repair different things like that kind of translates into the art department as well. And yeah, just kind of doing that to make ends meet while we were getting an animal among us, like up and on its feet. And then still very much the same thing, you know, it's like still doing consulting, 
uh, still doing a lot of different production work. So, you know, getting gigs here and there in between like the, uh, the filmmaking just to, to make it all work because at this point, you know, the filmmaking is pretty much like a full-time job. Um, it takes a tremendous amount of time, effort, and energy, but wasn't really able to position the first one in, in a way that would allow me to pay myself well, um, or really at all, because it would, it was my first film and it would then potentially inhibit our ability to get a positive return on the project because it would inflate the budget, you know? Right, right. That's, man, that's, that's a lot to take in. That's, that's insane, man. I, I, I still can't believe it. That's just, uh, I I remember sitting in classes and going to wrestling meets and this, that, and another. And yeah. Yeah. And I think it's as much of a surprise to me probably as it is to you. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm with you. It's like, I so vividly remember all of that stuff too. And it just doesn't seem that, that long ago. And again, I never would have guessed like I would have been a lot of this opportunity. And it's interesting because when you're in LA, like for me, I tend to always, you're, you're just so bombarded with like big films and the studios and the entertainment industry and like the celebrity factor. And you're like, Oh man, like I haven't done enough or I'm not far enough along or like, I need to, I need to do better. I need to go further. Um, and, and I think it's good to like have a degree of ambition, but to what we were just, to what you were just saying, you also have to maintain a degree of perspective as to like where you come from and all those things that you just referenced when we were sitting in class together, like drawing pictures because we were not paying attention or we're going to wrestling tournaments. It's like, it wasn't even a blip on the radar that this was a possibility, you know? So for me, I kind of try to maintain perspective of just like, this was an amazing opportunity um, that I never could have foreseen in my wildest dreams and I'm just like so exceptionally grateful that I've like gotten to go on the ride like at this point because didn't even see it coming, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean that's awesome. I mean you've been all over the world and that's that's insane. I'm I'm gonna have to get a hold of Bart too because he he I'm sure he's had his fair share of travel too, hasn't he? Oh yeah. I mean, Bart's done a tremendous amount of stuff. He lived in New York for a while and modeled. Um, he studied theater in London for a while, um, came back and now has been based out of Los Angeles for almost 10 years, lived in Las Vegas. I mean, he's run some of the biggest nightclubs in the world in Vegas. Um, and he's run some of the most prestigious like nightclubs and restaurants in Los Angeles, uh, huge into like VIP relations. I mean, that guy knows everybody in LA like you try to walk down the street in Los Angeles with Bart Clemmer and you're never going to get where you're going because literally so many people are like stopping and like oh hey Bart what's up man how you doing da, 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 da. and he knows everybody and it's it's so funny and it's so amazing to see because I think that for Bart like Los Angeles is basically like Brookville like <laughs> we know everybody in Brookville Bart knows everybody in Los Angeles yeah. and I mean yeah. everybody from you know the top of the top rock stars and movie stars to like everybody that's just like grinding it out out there trying to make things meet it's really something to see but uh and you know obviously still one of my absolute like closest friends and don't seem as much as i wish that i would just because la is funny like that traffic is bad and people are busy and so you know we get together a couple times a month but uh yeah it's it's just funny same kid that yeah rode the school bus with in first grade you know it's like basically lived down the street from in los angeles too you know that's that's awesome yeah so it's cool but you should definitely hit bart up as well i mean he's he definitely has some interesting stories oh i'm sure he does <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i run to his brothers every now and then around here i mean it's been a good minute but i i run into him and yeah, I when they come out to visit, I generally like if his mom comes out or either of his brothers come out, it's like we all try to get together at least once, you know, and uh, just fun to see. It's actually funny because when we did the premiere of the film in Los Angeles, uh, it was May 11th of this past spring, and you know, he's like, oh, you gotta come, you gotta come, you gotta come. and he couldn't come because he had this, he had a job, and so uh, 
I'm standing there like greeting people as they're coming in. It's kind of like a wedding or a funeral. You know, it's like you got to stand there. Oh, hey, thanks for coming. Like, hope you like it. All that stuff. And his mom walked in. And it was just so crazy because, again, it's like here is this woman that I've known since first grade, if not longer. And it was so out of context for me because we're in Los Angeles. And I didn't know that she had come to town to visit him. And so since he couldn't go, he sent his mom in his place. And it was amazing because my parents weren't able to make it out for it. Um, And it was just so incredible that, again, somebody from Brookville is like walking through the door that you've known since first grade. And it's just like, what? Like Bart's mom is there. It's like if Bart can't be there, it's like can't beat it, you know. (laughs) That is great, man. That is great. So um, where can people find you and follow you and follow uh, uh, Animal Among Us? Yeah, well, basically, uh, kind of what we were talking about earlier, just social media. If you get on Instagram, you just go to at Animal Among Us, you'll find the film. If you go to at the real John Woodruff, you'll find me. Um, if you find one, you'll find the other. Facebook, same thing. I'm just the John Woodruff um and animal among us on facebook is animal so you can find us there um you can definitely like check it out on imdb which is amazing you know go over there and give us a click because obviously it raises our rank and everything and the metrics are important so um if you get on youtube and you just google animal among us like the trailer will pop right up we're really excited about how that trailer is performing because it was mainly released just so that festivals had something to promote the film. We didn't really put like a huge amount of press and publicity into it, but um, the trailer has been cloned or shared to different YouTube pages over 30 times, which doesn't sound like a lot, except that usually that doesn't happen with trailers. You find them on two or three pages. You don't generally find them on 30. Yeah. And then when you start like adding up all of the cumulative views on each of those channels, it's quite a bit. So we're really excited about how the first trailer performed. And then again, the next trailer will be dropping soon. And when that one comes out, like there'll be a bit more of a publicity push and a press push with it. So we're really interested to see how that one performs. Um, but yeah, just, you can even check us out on YouTube and just give that trailer a look. And if you like it, hit a thumbs up. And if you don't, I'll just, you know, uh, if, if the, if, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, a trailer's a trailer. And I mean, uh, I think people that comment bad stuff on videos and stuff like that, they just ain't got nothing better to do. I mean, it's a trailer. It's, it gives you a basis. Jesus Christ. I, I, I'm super pumped to see this. So, well, I appreciate it, man. And I'll definitely keep you posted on everything and um, really appreciate you having me on and talking about the film and catching up because, I mean, in all honesty, this is the first time that we've caught up and really had a conversation since probably the time we ran into each other at that high school. <laughs> and that, that was a short, that was a short lived conversation right there. Cause I was dealing with high school kids back then too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely, uh, We'll, we'll get all the links up and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, the stuff will show itself. We'll, we'll, we'll start spreading more and let me know when a new trailer's out. We'll get it out more. We'll throw it up on our, our uh, social media pages. And I always share everything on my direct page. So Sweet. Well, yeah, man, I definitely appreciate it. And likewise, I mean, I'll definitely I look forward to sharing the podcast and spreading the word about that. And, uh, you know, I think everything you're doing with Sinful looks really cool. So, keep it up with that endeavor and i will uh i'll help you spread the word as well and we'll see see where we can go all right man john i really appreciate you having having you here on the show tonight man well thanks for having me it's good to catch up and then uh, if you want to do it again you know we'll we'll uh, see how it's going after the film comes out and uh might you know have a very different story for you by then <laughs> oh that's what i like to hear i like stories cool man well have a good night and then <laughs> i'll too, catch man. you soon Again, a huge thank you to John for coming and being on The Sinful Show. It means a lot. I've known John for a very, very long time, and yeah, that shows our age a little bit, but it's awesome to do that. Awesome to know people get out of small towns and follow their dreams and make things happen. You know anyone else with awesome story, getting out of small towns? Something crazy? Let me know. Shoot me an email at the sinful show. 
That's the sinful show at gmail.com. Sinful with a Y as always, guys. Get a chance, please, please hit up the iTunes reviews. We get them here and they trickle in and it's much appreciated. And everyone that listens to the show is much appreciated. We've already got another show lined up, getting ready to come out. Oh, goodness, goodness. We had an interview with a modern, um, uh, how should I phrase this? A person today that practices modern day witchcraft. That's going to be coming out real soon as well. Looking forward to that. So stay sinful, my friends. Voices of the stars. I don't think anyone has heard.